Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, these two guys are joining me. We're talking about engineering, and do you really need a tower anymore, at least at the studio? We don't need no stinking tower. It's coming up next on Twirt. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, savings, and support, online at bgs.cc. By the Ruby Console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twirt. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. And by the CalRec Type R console system. Type R is a brand new, modular, expandable IP-based radio system from CalRec Audio. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, these microphones to the light bulb at the top of the tower and everything in between. We've got a heck of a fun show for you today. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack, the host of the show. I work for the folks at uh, at the Telos Alliance. Today, I'm not in the usual Telos Alliance studio, though. Uh, I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska at a beautiful radio station, a place called My Bridge. And the engineer for this place Jeff is right here with me. We'll be talking to Jeff here in just a minute, but we thank Jeff for the facilities here to do the show from. Fantastic internet from two different providers. You bet. If one of them dies, work is still covered. And uh, then also Mark Voris uh, is here uh, from uh, Ca- uh, Spirit Catholic Radio, right? That is correct. And uh, we'll be talking to Mark, too. We got to visit with Mark uh, just a, a few days ago. Hey, but I want to bring in our uh, uh, co-host, and that is my friend Chris Tobin from New York City. Chris, welcome in. Well, I thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope we're having a good day. It looks like you guys are going to have a good time together. Nice one shot, three of you together. I can't imagine what's going to happen at dinner. <laughs> well, maybe I can't imagine. We just can't talk about it. Yeah, that's what it is, I'm sure. So it looks like you are in uh, the record library. Is that it? No, oh, sorry, Charlie. That's not correct. John, what do we have? Oh. Nothing. This is an uh, empty <laughs> office. It's just CDs on a shelf. That's it. That's okay. all we have. Oh, and well, would, when it comes boxes. time to put it in the can, guess what? We can put ah, it you in the, the can. can. <laughs> I have the can. <laughs> is that where that phrase came from? It's in the can. Yes, it is. It's in the wow. can. The, That's right. The 16 mil is on uh, its way. 35. Well, hey, we got we got a little bit of a late start due to a uh, power failure at the uh, main studio in New York City. So uh, that's why we got a little bit of a late start. Thanks for hanging with us. We're going to talk about some cool things. The title of our show today is, uh, what was it? What was it? Uh, where we're going. Where we're going. We don't need no towers. We don't need no towers. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to tell you the story about how we found our way to this studio and a little, little bit about building the studio, about uh, using internet technology, IT, uh, to make everything work here. And it's it's quite extensive what they're doing. So we're going to come back with that. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcasters General Store. Really appreciate uh, them participating and uh, helping us do the show. And BGS is the proud uh, distributor of equipment from Broadcast to Tools, including the Broadcast Tools Pro Mix 4. You're looking on your screen if you're looking at the Pro Mix 4, and a little bit interesting, this is a four-input console, four-fader console, but it's not really meant for typical production duties. You can use it for voiceover work. You can certainly use it for uh, doing ball games, parade coverage, remotes, uh, but it's really meant to go out in the field and do remotes. First of all, it is a mono console. Now, who would build a mono console? Well, somebody who wanted to keep things simple, where, 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 where you're doing voice, you're doing content creation with the human voice, having conversations, describing things like a football game, basketball game, a parade. Uh, maybe you're at the car dealership and you want to have separate mics for you and the, you know, the, the lead salesman and telling you about all the deals that are going on. Uh, well, the Pro Mix 4 could be just the ideal console for you. So what's about it? Well, it's got uh, three universal uh, monaural mic line level input channels. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? Each of these connectors uh, are either the, you know, there's those those Neutrik style connectors with either the um, XLR or the uh, quarter inch tip ring sleeve. Yeah. So you can plug your uh, whatever you've got. You know, hey, you can plug a guitar, electric guitar into this if you need to. Uh, uh, but that that. That works very well right there. It has one monaural balanced line level input as well, uh, balanced mono program output with a defeatable soft clipper. So if you got somebody who gets loud and says things like, he shoots, he scores, well, you can take care of that. Uh, with the uh, defeatable soft clipper. Built-in USB codec for computer audio playback and recording. Yeah, it's got one of those uh, USB. What style is that? Is that B or C or D? That 
the B, what, I B think is, 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 USB. The B is the big square one. Yeah, okay, that's a USB B. I think well, so. We'll use that with a USB A connector and connect to your laptop, just like we're doing here today with the, the little Behringer console. Um, it has a mix minus output, so you can take phone calls or or bring in other people on codex. Of course, an LED audio level VU meter, full duplex talkback capability. That's really cool. You can talk back to any of your other talent uh, or to a person on a codec or phone. So you can talk, you know, privately. Hey, we got to go in three minutes, or hey, I need you to talk a little bit longer, or uh, hey, we're out of time, kind of wrap it up. You know, you can say something like that. The audience doesn't hear that, but you know, the person talking sure does. It's got three quarter inch stereo headphone outputs with independent volume controls, IFB pan, and program pan controls. And uh, it can also drive multiple AHR One Plus headphone systems, also from Broadcast Tools. The price on this thing, it's well under $1,000. In fact, it's under $700 for this console, and it is just so cool. You need to check it out. Uh, the way to do that is go and talk to our friends at Broadcasters General Store. Uh, in fact, uh, Mary Schnelli from BGS is just in the next room. She's just, just out of reach right here. I wish she was here. She could say hi. You can give them a call at 352-622-7700 at Broadcasters General Store, or visit them on the web at bgs.cc, bgs.cc. Thanks a lot, Broadcasters General Store, and to Broadcast Tools and the ProMix 4. Really appreciate you both. All right, here we are at MyBridge Radio, and let's do a quick uh, find out about what is MyBridge. What's the elevator speech on MyBridge Radio Network? Well, MyBridge Radio Network is a network of seven full power and ten translators scattered across the state of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. We're a contemporary Christian format, been in existence on the air for uh, about uh, 18, 19 years, and uh, we cover uh, about 80% of the state and uh, based here in Lincoln, broadcasting from a new facility that came online uh, about two years ago in November. When uh, when I and when I turned it to uh, ask you the question, I forgot to introduce you, although I did yeah. briefly at first. This is Jeff Hines. Howdy. And Jeff, you list yourself as the chief engineer here. Uh, you appear to be pretty well versed in audio and in IT. Uh, we do it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the show title uh, is uh, Where We're Going, We Don't Need No Towers. No towers. Yeah. And and so here's here's the deal. So uh, we, we drove in the town. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, spending some time this week with Mary Schnelli from Broadcaster General Store, one of our sponsors. Also, Greg Dahl from Second Opinion Communications. They uh, he, he does lots of contract work, does a lot of installations of uh, audio over IP systems. So Greg and Mary and I are looking for MyBridge, and we have we have the a address dialed into the GPS. We're coming up, is it O Street? O Street. O Street. O Street. We're driving up O Street, and I say, look, Look, there it is. Why, there's the tower right there. And because there, there's an STL tower and it's got, it's just bristling with dishes. You know, it's got dishes all over the place on it. They just go right there. And Mary says, no, I don't think that's it. I said, what do you mean you don't think that's it? Of course that's it. That's it, that, that's it right there. And, and so we get closer and closer and Mary turns in like two doors before we get to the... <laughs> Mary, what are you doing? It's 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 right there. And she says, no, 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 it's right here. And I look, oh, yeah, it says, well, it says my bridge on this building. Maybe they've got several buildings. She says, no, they're not that big. They got one building. So I thought, Mary, huh? is this the admin building, the payroll maybe, you know? They do sales out of here? This is not the broadcast. This is not where the engineer would hang out. <laughs> I was giving her a hard time because I didn't know. And I've, you know, I've been to a few hundred thousand radio stations and right. and they they usually have a tower out back yeah. with the stl dishes so i'm so i'm starting and so we we park we go out at sure enough this is the building and i'm looking around thinking well now wait a minute well what's that up the street so tell me what we ran into here first of all what's up the street and then why don't you have a tower up up the street uh is broadcast house which is our friends from nrg media they have uh, a number of am and fm stations here in in lincoln okay uh, broadcast house has been there at that location with that tower probably for uh oh, probably uh -oh. about 40 years mid 70s <laughs> yep. yep and uh you know they started out as a am fm combo and mm -hmm. grew from there so uh, several years ago, when, when this building became available, we purchased it, uh, started the remodel process, stripped it down to the studs, the studs mm, pretty much, yeah. and, uh, -huh. uh re-roofed it and kind of rebuilt the whole thing. Um, so it's, it's 2017, uh, the way you get 
from the studio to the tower is not the way you did it in 74. You do it by fiber. Oh, well, we're going to find out about that. So, Chris, you can imagine my surprise when I when we drove up here and this is a this is it's it's a it's a it's a medium sized building. Um, it's, it looks very contemporary on the outside, but there's no tower. And that, and you know, I, I'm I'm a smart guy, but that did confuse me a bit. Chris, what would you think about driving up to a radio station that had no 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 antennas? There's no antenna hanging off the roof here. Nothing. Um, Chris, what what would you think? Not every day it doesn't have a uh, what do you call it? a tower or an antenna at the top. Not that you can see on the street. So I'd be the I'd be in the same boat. So, Chris, I, I'm not sure why, but we're not getting a good feed from you right now. Uh, we got a still picture and, yeah, I see and choppy, audio, choppy audio. So, hey, um, so we came inside and visited with you guys. You showed us around. And, uh, well, first of all, where's your nearest transmitter from the studio here? Uh, nearest transmitter is about uh, 12, 13 miles north of here. So you could hit it with uh, 950 megahertz STL yes. or uh, IP radio. Yep. You could, yep. but you don't. We don't. No. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, before the break, you mentioned that you have, uh, what, seven full power stations mm -hmm. and about 10 translators. Correct. All right. So um, you said, and you mentioned fiber. So tell me about your fiber service here at this building. Uh, here at this building, we have two discrete fiber providers, two different companies. Uh, they literally, one comes in from the, the street uh, in front, one comes in from the alley in back. Uh, they have two separate paths in and out of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got quite a bit of redundancy there. By the way, I, I, I have some friends who would, who would ask you this question, so I will. So you have fiber coming in the front door, fiber coming in the back door. Do you ever hook them together? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called a router. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm a <laughs> and, and you go in the router and you say, hey. <laughs> Uh, we, these goes into this goes out to there and these goes into this go out to there. <laughs> Speaking of router, let's touch on that for a sec because, uh, uh, you, well, well, we'll get to, you know, the description of some of the, the way you've built this place. It's all audio over IP. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, you know, that's linear here in the building. Then you've got lots of coded audio going out mm -hmm. in the field, but, uh, your router, um, I've been struggling this with, with this a bit myself. Uh, I have been a fan of Microtik routers. Mm -hmm. They've been extremely reliable for me, uh, but they are a little hard to program. And uh, um, so anyway, that's been a challenge for me to program them, do things like have failover for two different ISPs or, or load balancing uh, or even uh, one site to another VPN. That's been challenging for me. So what router are you liking these days? Uh, I've been using for 10 years probably a uh, an open source router project called PFSense. Yeah. And it'll run on anything from a virtual image on a on an ESXi host, or it'll run on a, a recycled Dell from the from the thrift shop, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or on a dedicated piece of hardware like a a small single unit single U PC. Yeah, I've seen these little uh, bricks, uh, mm -hmm. little brick PCs. N I guess they could run on a Nook, but yep. well, but but you need you. you Obviously, it needs at least two network uh, connections right. on it, uh, and some of these uh, sport, you know, three or four or five mm -hmm. network connections. But PFSense, why do you like PFSense? Um, it's very flexible. It does have a bit of a learning curve, but it's been around long enough, and it's open source. There's a lot of documentation on it. There's a lot of walkthrough videos and stuff, so you can mm -hmm. you can find help in the community. Uh, to do about anything you want to do, and it will do load balancing, traffic shaping. Uh, routing certain you can say okay kirk's laptop is going to go out this fiber I isp and mm -hmm. just laptop is going to go out over here or or whatever okay um i you mentioned we deliver audio to the towers via codex we have a a, a few tower sites where the isp has a higher latency mm -hmm. from one of our isps here as opposed to the other so oh. i route to that particular tower, its main routing is through the one that favors the ah, the latency. Gotcha. So you can do all sorts of little things like that. Plus, it uh, is a great little VPN server, and uh, you can so you can VPN site to site, as I mentioned, site to site VPN. Uh, but you can also do, I guess, you a lot of people call it Road Warrior VPN. So right. you got an employee at their house, right? They can yep. VPN. So your built-in clients uh, in Windows or Mac laptops will will work. Uh, your iPhone and, and Android clients will work 
right to the the server. It also has what's called Open VPN. Yeah, sure. So yeah. you can use that for site to site. Um, I use it on some of my VoIP phones, which has a built-in Open VPN client. So okay. the phone will boot up at my house or somebody's house, connect to the VPN, and then connect to our PBX ah, and okay. be online. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I want to take a second now and, and reintroduce uh, Mark Voris. Uh, Mark, you're with uh, uh, Ca Spirit Catholic Radio. Correct. That's over in Omaha. Yep. And you have a network of uh, transmitters as well across we, Nebraska. We do. We have uh, six full power, uh, two translators, and nine low power FMs that we program. Now, you and Jeff talk a lot about IP and, and, uh, and other radio engineering issues, right? We do. And we've worked together on a number of projects. And, you know, speaking of routers, um, we, we embarked on a, on a project utilizing ubiqu ubiquity edge routers. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and they have the ability to um, fail over to a second ISP. Um, we have some sites. He has a few. I have a few sites that have... Uh, we utilize one of the wireless carriers in the state as a backup for our main ISP connections. And uh, it took a little finagling and a little research to get things figured out with the edge routers to, to make it work the way we wanted it to. And that was the fact that the, the wireless carriers that we use, um, it's a metered service. So oh, yeah. when the main ISP came back online, then we wanted the the wireless carrier, the, the second IP connection, to kind of go into an idle state so that we weren't using data off of that. And we, we managed to figure it out, and it does work. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I've I've heard of other people connecting up some something similar too, to where the the four uh, G modem is their backup, but they don't want to. Uh, but they pay for the da the data, so they don't want to have to. Right. And and there are there are some sites. Um, there are some locations, and this this particular carrier is is slowly but surely upgrading their service to where eventually it'll become somewhat unlimited. And when it, it comes to that case, then we would just simply go into a load balance situation with the routers, and one would fail over the other. So, um, let's uh, let's move. I, I appreciate the advice on the router. I think a lot of engineers uh, kind of struggle with this. Now, some places you know have a nice big Cisco router or something that, that their IT department may may provide, but a lot of us are out there kind of on our own, providing the best advice we can. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, th I think five, six, seven years ago when I was putting in some Microtrick routers, I, it was, to me, that was a good decision because they physically lasted a long time. Oh, my goodness. I went through 10 years at just my home office working for Telos. Um, I went through, I probably went through 20 routers in 10 years, just cheap ones that would just fail. The power supplies would fail and all kinds of stuff would just, it, it, like, and they just get worse over time and then completely fail. Um, well, uh, and then the technology oh, yeah, up upgrades the, uh, and yeah. pretty soon the old routers are obsolete. Yeah. Yeah, slow and, and and don't have the right protections anymore and things like that. Right. So I, uh, I I I I I got to get on to some. But it, well, uh, well, we'll move on from there. Now, in both this facility here at, at my bridge and at Spirit Catholic Radio, you guys have really fully embraced audio over IP for your internal infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, can you tell me a little bit about uh, how you decided to to go with AOIP? Well, we were. We, we had the benefit of building a new facility. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we weren't remodeling something we had. This is, this is a, a new to us building. So we, we took it down to the studs, rebuilt the inside. So the studios were a complete blank slate. How do we design it? What makes sense? Well, one thing that makes sense when you have 14 signals, 17 signals you're taken care of, uh, my my close my closest transmitter to my home is, you know, like 10 miles. My farthest is 495 miles from my driveway. Whoa. That's, so, yep. uh, and, and that's my fault. That's my father's farthest full power signal. And then you go another 90 miles to my farthest translator. Oh, so, right. um, when I said I'm the engineer and the IT and I, I am, that's it. So, if I'm in the studio here, or if I'm at my home in Omaha, or if I'm in Alliance, Nebraska, 400 miles away, something's not working at the studio, I'm the guy that fixes it. Well, you can only do so much in the analog world. When you have something that's IP-based, when you can remote in, I can remote in and I can change inputs on the console behind yeah, us, yeah. you know, from from 
hundreds of miles away. Yeah. Um, Have you gotten that call? Hey, I forgot to tell you, we're doing a remote today. And you know that new codec <laughs> you put in, but it's not. Yeah, we need that to show up on the board. And your answer has got to be, okay. yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's there. Right. There you go. Um, yeah, no, give me I, a minute. <laughs> give, yeah. give me a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I have turned on sources on the board because, oops, uh, how do we get this to do this? Well, okay. Here it's on. There you go. Um, you know, but same way with the, the automation systems, with the, uh, the codecs and stuff. If you're able to get to them, you don't have to be in the same room with them. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can do 90% of what you need to do remotely if you have to. Mark, you, your story was a little bit different with uh, uh, Spirit Catholic Radio because you had a, an older facility there that you've been uh, putting newer audio over IP technology in. Yeah, and when we moved into that facility, Kirk, we had, it, it was brand new to us too, so it was kind of by from scratch, mm -hmm. and of course at that time we still had analog equipment and we wanted to continue using the analog, so of course I ran miles and miles of wire and Everything worked fine, but as time went on, uh, several years later, all of a sudden the equipment is to the point where you can't get parts for it anymore. It's starting to wear out. It's time to go to something new. Um, my recommendation was right away, oh, let's do AOIP. Um, financially, economically, it, it made sense to do that. So um, in addition to what Jeff was talking about, and a lot of engineers are finding this out today, that, um, you know, when you have a lot of sites to take care of, I mean, I have a total of 15. And when you're out on the road, or even if you're at the studio and you have a problem at one of your sites, um, the technology today has allowed us to be able to remote into those sites and just about interact with any piece of equipment at the sites. I mean, even the transmitters have IP connections on them. And, you know, the old adage, reboot, reboot it, and you know, sometimes it just takes a simple power cycle to correct a problem. Um, so that's given us a big advantage. And of course, in, in, as Jeff said, you know, when we're out on the road and something happens at the studio, yes, we can log in and we can make the changes necessary to make things work. Um, I created a router panel at our studio. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a that, beautiful panel. That yeah. allows yeah. me to send any, just about any source to the STLs. Yeah. And if we have uh, something that uh, didn't work on the automation, for example, and we need to switch to a different source, we can hot switch it through that router screen. Just I can do it on my phone. And you've got lots of metering right there on that screen. Yes. So you have confidence and control on one screen. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Hey, it just uh, occurred to me, uh, when we were at your place a couple days ago, uh, you had this incredibly wonderful piece of advice concerning remote uh, cameras. Now, don't say it now. I want to save that for the end of the show. Uh, but it, this, I'm going to implement that at all my sites. It's a great piece of advice. So during our tip of the week segment, at the end of this show, Mark's going to tell you, I mean, the most brilliant, simple thing that the, I can't believe I didn't think of it myself, but man, it's, just, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Hey, uh, it's Kirk Harnack. Uh, Chris Tobin, did you ever get reconnected with us? Are you there, buddy? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, hey, Chris, go. it's, it is so gratifying to come out here into what a lot of people call flyover country. And it's beautiful here. Uh, the drive from Omaha to Lincoln was just gorgeous this morning. Uh, uh, beautiful rolling hills. Tons of, of course, corn everywhere. We flew a tower last night with the drone, a uh, TV tower, but also your KVSS yep. is on that tower. That's correct. And uh, folks may have seen that posted on, on Facebook. But Chris, I'm just delighted to see the adoption of technology, even here in what, you know, a lot of America thinks of as flyover land. Uh, it's very encouraging. Well, you know, it's encouraging, but you have to remember, I mean, I learned a lot. I have family out out the Midwest that, you know, that part of the, this, that part of the country is where you, you, um, you think hard and heavy about what you're doing and how you're getting the job done and whether you own a farm, whether you own a business and you're in a downtown or a small city or a large city, it's all about getting things done the way it should be common sense. So I am not surprised that these two gentlemen look at the situation they're in outdated equipment, end of life. What do we do? we look to see what makes the best sense, both workflow and economically and they come up with oh this is the current technology let's see what we do and as i always say when somebody asks me you know i'm going to buy a computer what do i buy i say first question i have is what do you want to do with it so the same thing is true now with audio over ip it's like what do you want to do with it 
well, I want to do this, this, and this. Yep, you can. It comes with a price, but the upfront price is worth it over time. It it pays for itself. So I, I think it's great. And there's a lot of that going on in that part of the, you know that part of the country or in the flyover zones. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I sit here and I hear us talk about audio over IP. Like we're four shills for audio over IP. But man, I mean, this this if you're an no, engineer no, out there, if you're if you're a station owner. Uh, if you're a station owner that hasn't, that you haven't gone to all of our IP yet, oh my goodness. And I, I met a couple of, at the broadcasters convention that we're here for. They were still using some analog gear. I'm thinking, dude, dude, you really you, need you, to convert. You know, I ask the question all the time, where in the heck was this stuff 10 years ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness sakes. And I, every day I'm finding out something else that I can do that I never thought I could ever do before. Well, let me give an example. We have we have two remote studios outside of Omaha. When we had the on analog stuff before, we could not tie both studios together to where those two remote studios could converse back and forth. AOIP, yeah, it's a conference call. Yeah. I mean, these we have everybody talking to everybody and it's great. It, it does it does become a lot simpler. Hey, we have to take a, a quick break uh, to hear from, uh, well, an AOIP uh, console manufacturer called CalRec. We'll be right back in a minute. Go. CalRec's Type R is a modular, expandable IP-based radio system featuring three slimline panels, a fader panel, a large soft panel, and a small soft panel easily configured to give the operator full control. Layouts are saved and recalled quickly between shows. A single 2RU core with integrated I.O. gets customers up and running fast, and that single core can power up to three independent mixing environments with no sharing of DSP resources. Available in four DSP packs and as your station grows larger packs can be added enabling it to grow with you power to the surface is supplied via standard poe switches keeping cabling to a minimum type r is fully aes 67 compatible as defined by SIMPTE 2110 which means that it is also compliant with nmos discovery and connection management specs all these features combined make type r the most flexible radio console you can buy find out more at calrec.com slash twerk Thanks a lot, CalRec, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And go to calrec.com slash twerk because they are audio over IP with AES 67. Okay, hey, I want to talk to you for a minute about an accessory that goes along with your audio over IP. And this, these came along well before audio over IP, and engineers loved them then. And I got to tell you, they love them even more now. I do especially. And that is, a lot of people call these dongles. I think the correct word is wiring adapters. Uh, on one end, we've got RJ45. On the other end, we've got uh, you know XLR, or you can get quarter inch, or even uh, uh, 3.5 millimeter, you know, the eighth inch uh, uh, connectors, or bare wire. But these make your wiring so much easier. So let's say you've got a, a CD player, and you want to bring that into your console or your audio over IP system. Well, you would buy this adapter, except you get the female uh, XLRs on there, and you plug that in the back of the CD, the professional CD player. Then from here, you take whatever length of RJ of you know Cat5 cable with an RJ45 connector, whatever length you need. Uh, you know, a one foot cable. I've got a bunch of those. A lot of times, I'll have to go just a very short distance, so I I buy a whole lot of the one foot uh, uh, patch cables. Uh, or uh, if you have to go longer, you know, three foot, six foot, seven foot, ten foot, fifty foot, whatever you need, uh, you can you can just plug that in. And at the other end. If you've got, you know, a uh, uh, an X node from uh, from Axia, or you got one of the other brands of uh, audio over IP uh, inputs or outputs, you just plug. A lot of them have RJ forty fives. You just plug them right in there, and you are wired up in literally seconds. Seconds. Now, uh, this was the first kind to come out, where you've got a female uh, RJ forty five there. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because people have gotten used to using these. And then all of a sudden, the folks at Radio Systems that make Studio Hub brand, they said, we're closing our doors. We are we are done with business. It's been a great run. Well, our friends at Angry Audio, angryaudio.com, are making these exact same cables. In fact, shh, don't tell anybody, but they're made in the same factory by the same people. <laughs> they just don't say Studio Hub on them. So Check that out. AngryAudio.com. They've got the original kind right here. Some folks prefer the ones that have the RJ45 already built into them like this. Uh, so you can go you know, from the output of some device and 
into this. If you need a short cable, you got that. They sell longer cables as well. I think they have six foot cables, a lot of those around. And if you are running AES digital audio, AES3, well, that's easy to do because you just need one cable like this, carries stereo over AES. And so there you go, uh, RJ45 to AES. The way to get these is call your favorite broadcast dealer. Um, uh, Broadcast General Store has these as well as, as many others, and ask for the adapter cables from Angry Audio. You can go to the website, angryaudio.com, and check them out right there, as well as the other guest gizmo and all the gadgets and gizmos that uh, that they have there at angryaudio.com. And Jeff, I wanted to ask you, you've, you've done a fair amount of wiring with these, right? Yes. I, I call this the, the toilet paper over the top the way you're supposed to do it. And then other, I, this is the to toilet paper behind the back method right here. Do you have a toilet paper method that you prefer? Well, you know, in Nebraska, we have a lot of corn cobs. <laughs> oh, no. and, I, and, I use both. I, yeah. I, I have a combination of both it, of those here. And there's a little yeah, trick with this. Let's okay. say you only need an XLR cable that's only less than a foot in length. You just simply plug these oh, together. Look at that. And you know you what? have yourself a stereo XLR you know, cable. <laughs> you know what? I had a, an, a particular need on the back of a, uh, a Telos Zip 1 codec, and I needed to just feed the output back to the input. And there's there's a couple ways to do that, but this was just the easiest way. In fact, yep. I think I may have pulled this off of the back of that Zip 1 to bring along and, and show the folks. But angryaudio.com, uh, you can still get the exact same connectors uh, that you're used to from, from Studio Hub that say that, that are built to that specification. Thanks a lot. AngryAudio.com for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right. So we're talking with uh, Mark Voris and also Jeff Hines. Uh, they're both with some radio stations here in Nebraska. And uh, I find it interesting. Uh, and here in Nebraska, you guys have uh, like one studio and a whole lot of transmitters. At least at least your networks operate that way. Yeah. Uh, but now that the station's up the street here at what you call Broadcast House, mm -hmm. are they a bit more traditional? Uh, one studio, one transmitter? Uh, yeah, they have several studios for several transmitters, but they're all within the, the Lincoln market coverage. Yeah. Area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're both, uh, operating non-commercial. Yeah. Um, uh, mm -hmm. so if, when you needed a waiver <laughs> to have a mate, have a main studio located right. away oh, yeah. from your transmitter, which you don't need anymore. Right. Um, non-commercials could get that. So. Uh, yeah. we've, we've always operated with one or two studios. We have a, we have a small studio halfway across the state, uh, morning show. Oh, okay. We have a couple of people here, one person over there. And so they're interacting and doing the morning show. And, 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 and let me add to this too. A lot of his, some of their staff here actually work from other locations yes. around the country and around the state, anyway. around the state anyway, yeah. and actually get in, uh, Via IP? Yeah, via codec. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Wow. So, um, uh, Jeff, thinking about building this place out, uh, I wish we had the cameras to show you this. Uh, we're in a studio here that when I walked in, I was, I think the word is agog with the sleek cleanliness of the studio. You from when you walk in the door, if you look carefully, you can see about three feet of wire in this place, and that's all you can see. And yet you've got Five monitors right behind us here, a monitor on the wall. Uh, you've got headphone jacks. You've got microphones. Uh, you, you've got all the standard stuff. You can handle, what, four people in the studio, an operator and three guests. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got the console here. You've got some gear right behind us over here, power supply and a couple other things. How in the world did you hide every wire? And I thought, it's, it's all this wireless? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, so, yeah. so uh, t tell uh, uh, tell us about first of all hiding the wire. I looked underneath here, and under this 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 table right here, the tabletop that holds the console and the monitors and everything, all the wiring is under there. And you've got lots of adapters, a uh, power some wall warts, uh, but it's all like sucked up against the bottom of the table. How did you? What, what techniques did you use to get that done? Well, first off, all of the all of the computers, there, there's multiple monitors in here. There's four computers feeding in here, but the computers are in the rack room. Oh, it's dead quiet in here. Yeah. It is dead quiet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that means that video and mouse and keyboard needs to get into here. Well, sure. that's that's over Cat5, Cat6. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's a, an adapter that has a, has a wall wart. Yeah. So you got a whole bunch of those. You've got a whole bunch of uh, adapters and wall warts for the headphone amps and 
various different things. The the lights that light up when the phone rings and the the mics are on and stuff all all have some stuff. The uh, the the countertop is designed so that it has a lip about this thick. Mm-hmm. Um, so hidden up under there, bolted up, and of course nobody puts um, screw mounts on wall warts or, or yeah. adapters of Wouldn't anything. So yeah. there's a lot of cable ties with the with screw eye in it, tight cinched down and screwed up into the the wooden underside of the countertop. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I, I really annoyed the, the cabinet makers because they like to use particle board mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it works real well for their for their uh, tops to stick right, on. But, but you put a screw in a particle board, it's easy to pull it. I mean, you can break right. things. Right. So, so the requirement on this stuff was you can use thin particle board for the top, but I want three-quarter inch real plywood. So there's uh, three-quarter inch real plywood. Mm-hmm which is the lowest layer. And then they got particle board because that works good for making the, the countertop stick. Really smart. And I, 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 I didn't realize it until you said it, but yeah, all these little screws. And sometimes you use, have to use a short little screw. I don't know how th- uh, thick all that wood is there, but yeah, you don't want that pulling back right. out. That's going to ruin that. So real right. plywood on the bottom layer yep. here. Uh, and you know, if you even get down and look uh, on a flat plane across the bottom, you can't see a wire. Right. Now, if you get underneath there, you look up there. Oh my goodness! It's a it's a wonderland of of, of uh, wall warts and and the uh, the uh, HDMI adapters mm-hmm. and all that stuff you've got under there. Uh, a couple of power strips are up yep. under there. Wow. Yep. All comes to an umbilical down on the other side. Well, and, well that's and, the other thing. So you you laid out this cabling very neatly underneath there, and it's all sucked up against the against the bottom. But this tabletop goes up and down. You got uh, somebody tall in the morning, I think, and then you've got short people. Some people want to sit down. Some people want to stand on stilts. Look at this. Now, <laughs> we've we've been to stations where people have this, but look at that. And um, when it, with this is kind of like a car jack to to yeah. uh, to work on the muffler, right? Yeah, it'll go fifty inches up off the floor, so <laughs> you don't need the creeper to lay underneath and do the right. wiring. You can actually you sit. can actually, you can take an office chair and tilt it all the way back, and <laughs> just, just be careful when you sit up. That you're clearing the edge, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is amazing. Now, uh, I've been, the last several stations I've been in. Now, Mark, your made yours didn't have this hydraulic. No, we did not. But I've been to a couple stations here in the area that had this. Is, is this an ADA requirement or what? what not that what? I'm aware of, but it certainly helps. Yeah, it uh, does. It yeah. does help. Okay. Uh, you know, we're we're ADA compliant in the rest of the building yeah. for access and, and restrooms and that kind of stuff. So it only makes, well, it, it, it was really because we have some folks that like to stand, some folks that like, like to sit. sit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we, even the ones that stand, we have people that are different heights. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, make it comfortable. If, if you're, if the operators are comfortable, they're going to enjoy doing what they're doing and they're going to make good radio. So this implies, though, that the cables, uh, you have an umbilical, and obviously that has to move. Yes. So the cables from where the umbilical attaches at the edge of the counter over here, mm-hmm. underneath, those wires are all pretty much to length. Yes. You've got those about right yep, uh, or tied up if there's mm-hmm. any extra. And then the umbilical, you've got, what, about a four, five, six-foot mm-hmm. umbilical there. And then it comes over to this rack. And right. what you've, you, I guess you've got uh, several runs of uh, Cat 5. Yes, the, uh, the facility is wired with Cat 6. Mm-hmm. And there's 24 Cat 6, six runs to this area okay. for, for the console. Uh, a- actually, well, today there's two of those are carrying IP. One One's to do the show. The other one's to the uh, the console. Okay. Because that console, two wires. Yep. Power and, yep. and, and IP. Yeah. So uh, three wires. Always ground. Your oh, yeah, that's right. Please Always. do. <laughs> so three wires. The that's green right. one, Ethernet, and power. That's right. <clears throat> because you're going to get static electricity, and you're going to not be happy. And we've experienced <laughs> that. Have you? Yes. Yeah. So, that's um, yeah. yeah. So all the other ones are carrying uh, KVM, mm-hmm. uh, GPIO data for the for the on-air lights, mm-hmm. uh, some analog audio for the, for the headphone amps, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Yeah, that's right. Because your your um, your your Axia mix engines are all over the there. Yep. So, uh, do you have any uh, I/O in here, uh, or is it all over there? <laughs> There's four mics. Yeah, so they come in what, to a mic note or something. They, or uh, I'm using the uh, power station, so they actually uh, there are actually four microphone oh, cables so that over and over there. Yeah. Okay. So gotcha. I've, I've I've soldered eight 
XLR connectors in the building. I, I know that some of our viewers and listeners are familiar with uh, with the Axia range of products, and they're my employer. Uh, and one of them is the Axia Power Station, and it has a whole lot of stuff on the back. It's got a built-in Ethernet switch with a bunch of ports, and it's got four mic inputs and a bunch of uh, some line inputs, line outputs, AES in and out, mm -hmm. GPIO in and out, uh, CAN bus in and out, uh, video, and you have got every single hole filled up on that thing. Yeah. I've, I've never, yeah. never seen, I took a picture of it. I've never seen an Axia power station where everything is absolutely used. <laughs> good you good for it. you. You got to use it. <laughs> You'll be wanting to get another one next <laughs> yeah. Just because he's run out of ports. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, one thing I want to expand on too yeah. is he has a lot of spare runs of ethernet mm -hmm. that come over here. Yes. When you guys run ethernet to your studios, for crying out loud, run, <laughs> run as many spare lines as you can because there will be one that fails. Yeah, or you'll or you'll figure or, out, or new you'll things. need another one. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then you don't want to have to be pulling wire again through the ceilings or wherever it is you, you're going with it to get more line in there. So pull spares. Yeah, I I would never pull, you know, to an office or whatever i would never pull less than two runs i would yeah. always say at least three pro usually four because mm -hmm. it's the least expensive to do it when you're doing it it's a lot more expensive to come in and do it later when you realize you need another run that's right we've got a uh, break in about the next three or four minutes for our last break but i wanted to touch on uh, something first and that is what we started the show talking about you don't have a tower here your stl your studio transmitter link to all these sites is over IP or or their or their translators picking up off the air, right? Translators all pick up I all my translators pick up off the air. We yeah. have two that are in the NC band that we could feed otherwise, yeah. but they pick up off the air. So but you elected to uh you're you're not using uh 950 megahertz or even IP radios, not even to your nearest one. You're using all IP, you're using codecs. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, uh and, and these are um, nailed up codecs, mm -hmm. uh uh what kind of bit rate are you electing to send all these sites? Different bit rates, or uh, it's it, on a couple of them. It's a little bit lower bit rate, just because of the connectivity at the at the remote, at the remote tower. Side. Okay. Um, otherwise, they're one twenty eight AAC plus. Okay. Okay. That implies that every transmitter side has its own audio processor. Yes. Right? And EAS gear. At, yes. At, yes. Okay. Yes. yes okay. Because we're, you know, we're not all in one. We're not seven stations in one metro area. We're right. seven stations hundreds of miles apart. So. Uh, our Nebraska state plan requires us to monitor NOAA weather mm -hmm. and you pretty much have to pick up NOAA weather in the area where it's at because I can't pick up, I can't pick up warnings for the Western part of the state here in Lincoln. They don't put them out over the weather radio here. I remember some, I mean, it's been some years ago and I just, I've, I've been preaching for years. Look, the internet is just going to get better and better and better, mostly due to competitive forces and, you know, consumers want more. They want to watch their Netflix next it's Netflix in, in 4k. Someday it'll be Netflix in 8k. I mean, people demand more companies providing internet like to make money. And especially when there's more than one game in town, they got to keep up with the Joneses to do this. And so am I naive for thinking that, 10 years from now, it, generally speaking, internet access, even in rural areas, will get better and better and better. Uh, I think it's going to get better and better and better. I mean, it that's the demand. Um, whether we see it come right to where our tower site is, that kind of depends. I mean, I've got one tower that's, you know, 30 miles from nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's surrounded by sand hills, the Nebraska sand hills, uh -huh. surrounded by sand hills and cattle. So there's not even uh, wireless ISP customers around the tower, are there? Not a lot. Yeah, not a lot. One of our, our one of our providers had been one of the the wireless ISPs, and frankly, they were oversubscribed because uh. expense the the tower the tower we're on the tower they were on uh, the cost goes up. You know, mm -hmm. out in the middle of nowhere, the cost goes up, and they could only provide so much bandwidth to that. Now, we were fortunate that uh, that one of the fiber providers that we have here at Lincoln is a statewide fiber provider, oh. and they were smart enough that when they were laying out their network, they looked to see where towers were, mm -hmm. both cell mm -hmm. towers and the real tall ones. Mm -hmm. So we had a fiber provider that trenched into the gravel road ditch next to, you know, within, you know, 500 feet of the tower. Yeah. So 
it finally became available. And this year we actually lit up 100 by 100 fiber at that tower. So from my building here, 495 miles away, I have five millisecond latency. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's great. Um, you, but you, you said something really smart then. It just makes sense uh, if, if for companies that are laying fiber. And fiber's been going through my neighborhood now for mm -hmm. two years, and they just laid a whole bunch more underground. It, it had been above ground. And if you're laying it out in the country, you, you know cell sites are going to get with 5G coming along. It, we just don't have probably enough bandwidth just from site to site microwave, you know, for to 100 miles so fiber's got to go in the ground got to go to cell sites but as long as you're looking for cell sites to run fiber to or close to you ought to look at other at other towers too yes yeah, towers yeah. transmit information right it happens to be that where that particular tower is there's a tower a mile east of us and a tower a mile west of us okay uh the the tower we're on is owned by a tv station the tower east of us is owned by uh the statewide uh public TV network. Um, so it was a no brainer for the, the fiber company to go. We really want to be there where those TV towers are because they're going to yeah. need us someday. Well, yeah. we, we happen to be the ones to light up first. Ah. So. You're watching and listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 456. Uh, Kirk Harnack is uh, me. I'm here along with Chris <laughs> Tobin is in New York. Uh, Jeff Hines is here and Mark Voris is here as well. And uh, we get, we got tips of the week coming up next. Uh, as always, I'm sure Chris Tobin will have a good one. And Mark Voris has one that you don't want to miss because it's brilliant. It's cheap. And I don't know why I didn't think of it myself. So I'm, I'm excited to implement it myself. It's coming up in a minute after this word from Lavo. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at, but have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once in a blue moon controls to a touch sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes. And enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo radio tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And do go to their website, lavo.com slash twert. It'll take you right to their radio products and let them know that uh, we sent you. All right. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack, and uh, Chris Tobin is along, and we, we've got tips for you, so uh, stay tuned. Chris Tobin, I wonder if you could go ahead and kick things off and give us your tip of the week, and we're going to make people just keep hanging on for the one that I've been building up from Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, let's see. Since we're talking about the RJ45 XLR male female dongles, or the angry audio solution to your need for using Cat5, Cat6 throughout your plant. As Steve Lampin has always said in many of his presentations, you can pass balanced audio over a Cat5 twisted pair cable. So I thought about that years and years ago when I was implementing AOIP, and I'm not a shill for AOIP or any particular brand. There are five brands on the market you can choose from, so I'm not even going to talk about it. Anyway, I started using those crazy little molded dongles from Radio Systems, Dan Braverman's company, as ways of transporting audio around the plant. Now think about this. 
You have a Cat5 panel in your various closets, in your TOC, maybe in the studios. And every so often you need to get audio to a place. Maybe it's program director's office. And you happen to have a quad box or maybe a, several quad boxes of RJ45s on the wall. How cool is it when you take a dongle from Angry Audio, plug it into the program director's office, into a Fostex speaker or something else. And back in TOC, you just take the output of a AOIP converter, has analog audio come out of it, stick it in. And now you got audio going. That's one option. The other one is out on remote broadcasts, outside broadcasts. Need to make a quick snake or need to deliver audio back and forth in a crowded area. Roll out your Cat 5, shield a pair is a better choice. And now you got audio going back and forth in no time. I've done it just recently. And it works really well. So those are, the, those are two tips to consider. And thinking out of the box for the RJ45, what we used to call dongles, we now call the Angry Audio Solution. Go for it. Check that out. All right, Chris. Good, good tips, and and uh, yeah, it's it's amazing what balanced audio can do. And you know, even though we we espouse audio over IP, sometimes you got you got to run some analog audio somewhere, or even some AES audio. You do. And but thank goodness for the computer industry inventing cat cat cable because it works quite well for for audio as well. All right, uh, do you have a quick tip or not? Um, I do. Y you do? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I thought the whole your whole shows here have been about tips, but go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> well being on the road all the time mm -hmm. one of the things uh, one of the things our whole organization kind of strives for is it and and people have been buzzwording this for decades but paperless um so you don't see a lot of paper clutter here we we interact with everything right. we right. interact with uh different apps on our phones uh things like evernote where you can store all sorts of data, mm -hmm. Dropbox, where you can share files and mm -hmm. uh, all of that kind of stuff. So one thing that I found really handy, and even before I came on board here, was Evernote, which you can open it up on your smartphone, on your laptop computer, on your home computer, whatever, uh, and type information in. So I'm sitting here preparing for a, a trip out west. What do I need to do? Oh, I need to do this, 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 and this at this tower. So I type it in an Evernote. I've got a to-do list now. I can pull it up on my phone. I can pull it up on my laptop, whatever. It's there. When I get to the site, I can check things off as I do them. If I find something at the site that I didn't expect, oh, type myself a note. There's no little pieces of paper to get lost and blow out the truck window when you're going through the drive through There's, you know, uh, it, it's, it's all there. Yeah. And if you... For some reason, drop your phone, you know, and it goes, and the phone goes away. Yeah. Well, it's already synced to the cloud, so right. you still have that information there. Now, I've used Evernote, loved it, um, but I, when I kind of got into the whole world of Google Docs, I used Google Keep to mm -hmm. take quick notes, and I that find that too. to be pretty effective too. That phone, too. laptop, tablet, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, you know, as old engineers, it's hard to get us to change. And then there's one note uh, from Microsoft. A lot right. of folks use, exactly. use that too. Good advice. And the, the great thing is, and as soon as you type it in, it's in the cloud. Right. And right. and you can pick it up anywhere you need to. It's not necessarily the product. It's the way you, the way you the way change you your the way you use it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You can always write down things on a piece of paper. That's great if it works for you. I was always losing stuff. So, so, <laughs> so, uh, uh, for, for some time now, we've had these beautiful IP cameras that have gotten cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And we've, some people put them at transmitter sites. The problem, though, is, and we didn't know it was a problem until we knew you didn't have to do this, but a lot of them offer infrared uh, uh, lighting on them. So you can turn the lights out, and you still have a picture, although it's a fuzzy black and white picture, from the transmitter site. And if there's some LEDs indicating uh, you know, status, green and red LEDs look exactly the same when the camera is in the infrared mode. Mark Vorce, what's your solution to this problem? Well, I'll tell you what, it's a real simple solution. I, I'll tell you what, I did that. and the difference it made when I did this, mm -hmm. I went to the farm store and I picked up one of these uh, um, light fixtures that you would use for heat lamps in a chicken house or yeah. something that's got yeah. the metal shield on it. Yeah, like a clamp. A clamp yeah, well, that you could clamp, clamp it, you know, mm -hmm. clamp it onto a a board or a rafter or a conduit or whatever. And I got a 60 watt LED bulb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I prefer to go with the, uh, I try to get the, the real daylight. I, I try to get the daylight LEDs because they're the brightest and they're the clearest. Mm -hmm. 
And I guarantee you, folks, you can see the colored LEDs on all your equipment. Um, you know, if you have a status problem or something, and it's something that, that a red LED is supposed to come on, if you're looking through an infrared, you're not going to know. You're not going to tell. Right, right. And, and and what you're really getting at here is leave the lights on. Leave the lights on. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it, kids, kids. Kids, it's a nightlight. <laughs> so just well, leave the nightlight on. Well, and it doesn't use any energy or hardly any, hardly energy. any energy. And I just plug it in. I leave them well, on all the time. You know, look, uh, you're a dad, right? Yes, sir. I'm a dad. Yep. And we're, we're, for years, I've been going around decades, going around, turn the lights off after turn the kids. Turn the lights yeah. off. After my wife, after the kids, turn the lights out. Why? Because my dad said turn the lights out. Why? Because incandescent bulbs cost money to run. That's right. Then we switched to the, those horrible uh, compact fluorescents. But now we got LED bulbs. And, you know, they're not perfect, but they're awfully good. And they're, they, they really are getting better. And uh, But I'm in the habit of turning them off anyway. At your transmitter site, put LED bulbs in or get uh, or light something up extra, like with the, the, right. the clamp that you said, and leave the freaking lights on you know and let the camera think it's daytime. <laughs> That's right. You know, leaving the <laughs> put the light right above, right in front of the transmitter so that it shows light. And, and one side, I had to move the light kind of up and bounce the light off the ceiling in the room because it was a low ceiling in there. Mm -hmm. And it was because it was too bright. I, and I couldn't see the modulation monitor uh, yeah, <laughs> readings. Yeah. Um, sometimes you have to readjust for that. But, yeah, leave the light on because it will show you. I mean, you'll see everything in brilliant color, just like the, the regular room well, lights are on. And I've had a couple engineers from a few of my sites. We lease, we lease space on towers. Mm -hmm. And I've had a few people can, uh, tell me, boy, we sure like that nightlight being on in there when we walk in there at night. At yeah. least we can see the the darn light switch to turn the lights on. Well, uh, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm back to this thing about we used to, well, let's turn the lights out, not using more electricity than we had to. Right. But with LED lights, I mean, you might you might burn 35 watts worth of power uh, leaving all the lights on in, with in, in a good sized transmitter room. Yes, sir. Leave them on and let and and if you have you know for your security cameras or your internal monitoring camera, let them do their work. Let, let, let them see everything in the in the light. Right. I'm going to do that, and uh, I'm not going to use infrared lights. Well, now outside our house, sure you you, know, you want the lights out, but yeah, but so you well, can... but then even then, it's a good deterrent. That's true from yeah. prowlers yeah. coming around. And the nice thing of it is, if somebody breaks into your building. Mm -hmm. You'll have a better a better picture better of them. picture of them <laughs> when they right. come in, and you will with that infrared camera. That's right. Good uh, good advice. I and I've seen Mark. I've seen your video display in your office of different transmitter sites, and they look great. And I, I, hey, how come you're? What kind of camera you guys? Says, well, it's not so much the camera. I, just, I left the lights on. Right. <laughs> so, exactly. Okay. Get out of that habit of turning the lights off. You don't have to anymore. <laughs> uh, hey, we got to go. Uh, <laughs> Chris, what do you think about leaving the lights on for your camera? I I would. Yeah, why not? Uh, yeah. I use LED. I use LED lighting in a lot of places and you do the measurement, it's very very minimal impact on the electrical bill. And but it oh, yeah. makes yes. sense, makes total sense. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I I don't know why, but that has totally struck me as being a very worthwhile tip. Even <laughs> as simple as it is, that and PF sense. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, PF we got to go. Is I want to <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, I'll, I, I hope to find out soon. Hey, I want to thank uh, all of our sponsors uh, for being part of the show. It helps make the show possible. Thanks so much, especially today, to Broadcasters General Store uh, for providing me some transportation over here today. Mary Schnelly uh, brought me over here. Greg Dahl is here as well. We couldn't get him on the show. We didn't have enough headsets, and uh, I didn't have time either. We get two great engineers on the show here, and my goodness, uh, it's going to take up all the time with all the advice. So thanks to everyone who helped make the show possible today. Uh, I want to thank the Telos Alliance for affording me a couple hours to get out here and do this as well. And thanks to our producer, Suncast, solved all the problems earlier in, in the show. Man, the power went out and he got everything back on ASAP. And also uh, thanks to Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network. We got to go uh, next week. Another great show. Gee, I forget who it is, but I know it's great. Also, I found out yesterday, Jeremy Ruck is going to be able to join us sometime after the repack is over. Yep. Uh, but he's got some great information for us, too. we got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.